So the recording will be available uh, on the meeting page and also possibly on YouTube or something. Um, so that's 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 all for now. I, I don't see Richard uh, on the call anymore. Maybe he he got kicked out. Um, anyway, so I'm going to ask uh, Richard, who is the um, who I've had pleasure uh, had a pleasure of uh, working with uh, on the early days of R3. Uh, in the architecture working group uh, and started this organization called Lab 577. And Richard uh, can explain everything uh, about how, what, what their products are and how it's going to disrupt uh, the financial markets infrastructure. Uh, thanks Richard for showing up. And uh, I think Richard is going to um, to do his I'm thing. Still, uh, I, can, you, can you hear me, Vipin? Yeah, I can hear you and I can see your screen. Excellent. Well, I'm getting there then. Let's, uh, let's, let's start the ball rolling. We don't have many participants on the call. So um, uh, what I would ask you to do is if you've, you've got questions, do, do feel free to throw them out. I might not answer them immediately. Uh, I might park them and, and come back to them. Um, but what I'm interested to do is, is walk through the slides uh, relatively rapidly um, and then uh, turn it over to Q&A. Uh, we've got a full hour, um, but if uh, the, the questions dry up, we can, uh, we can definitely uh, hand this over um, and, uh, and close it down. Um, I normally don't hear the code of conduct uh, being read so, so well. Um, normally it's the antitrust law being uh, lectured to us. So uh, uh, it's really nice to, uh, to hear the code of conduct once in a while. Um, so Richard Crook, um, I run Lab 577. I'll go into a bit more detail of my background and, uh, as part of the, the slides. Uh, but what I wanted to do to, today was, uh, just as the description on the, on the talk spoke of, we'll give you a description of the platform, um, which brings together some of the pieces we've been working on uh, and hopefully give you a more holistic view of the solution uh, where we've got now a number of, uh, number of projects, a number of brands out there. Uh, all of them are interlocked and therefore we wanted to uh, give this as an opportunity to, uh, to members uh, recognize what we're doing uh, and maybe uh, see where that takes us uh, as a journey. Okay, um, just uh, working through these slides. Let's start with the uh, start. With the start. Um, so, I'm Richard Crook, uh, I stepped out of uh, Royal Bank of Scotland, took my team with me. Uh, we were running the emerging tech team over there uh, back end of 2018. Uh, and in doing so, uh, we stood up a company called Lab 577, uh, which sits in the nexus between financial services and emerging technology. Emerging technology for us are AI, quantum, blockchain, uh, where predominantly a, a large chunk of our time right now is being spent on blockchain, a distributed ledger, if you will. Um, and that comes from uh, a lot of work we did in the early days. Uh, my team and I um, broke cover when we uh, backed Ripple uh, into uh, the FX wholesale trading desk of RBS. Uh, we built a, a distributed ledger for uh, the five Irish banks and that allowed us to recognize things like the privacy requirement uh, and realize we needed a, a finance into micro which will get you to take it to, to series A. Um, we let them uh, grow quarter until about version three, I think it was, uh, back in 2017, when, when many people were watching the Bitcoin price uh, go through the roof and we were watching a financial battle. Um, my team and I recognized the killer feature of accounts and tokens, uh, and we could see that the need here was a best of breed uh, of bringing accounts and tokens out of Ethereum and getting that functionality into Corda, which will give us both privacy and the, uh, the accounts and token functionality. So we did that. 
uh, back in uh, back in the 2017, broke cover with it. In 2018, we released it, um, mostly from the legal perspective to rid RBS uh, of its liabilities um, into open source. Uh, there was no desire to, uh, to make money out of that. What we were doing was attempting to uh, accelerate the Corda community. Um, and that's really what Cordite as an open source project has been doing. Um, it's been driving new disruptive controversial features uh, into the Corda space. Uh, and also uh, we have always had an eye on the convergence of both crypto uh, and what we would describe as enterprise blockchain, where we knew that the mainstream financial space would come together uh, with crypto. Uh, and we wanted to, uh, to be part of that journey. Um, so Cordite, uh, from that perspective, is an open source project. Um, more than welcome to, to dive into the code. Um, there's a fair amount of code right now. Pretty much anybody in the Corda space uh, finds themselves using a bit of Cordite. Uh, usually the network map service uh, is the first place uh, they find themselves using Cordite. Others have started to use the tokens, the accounts. Um, one of the pieces that was long forgotten was the uh, first digital mutual or the mutual society where we went to the FCA, sat in their sandbox and created a cooperative, a UK cooperative that we call the mutual, uh, a digital mutual. Um, that has been gaining dust over the last couple of years. It was too early. Uh, we couldn't uh, get the, the type of traction we wanted with it. Um, people were still very much in the, in the mindset of tokens at the time. Um, but we recognized that one of the great use cases of uh, distributed ledger was in the, the concept of decentralized finance. Um, the idea that you could bring a small group together, a syndicate, um, and I use the word syndicate because you see syndicates in the insurance space with Lloyds, you see syndicates in the lending space uh, under syndicated loans. We recognize the strength of using uh, blockchain as a way of pulling uh, together parties, uh, to act as one uh, under a legal structure. Um, earlier this year, um, my team and I uh, had a opportunity uh, to focus once more uh, on uh, this area. And what we did was work to uh, create a, a new digital currency. Uh, this is the first digital currency on the Corda public network. So for those of you not aware, there is a public Corda network. Uh, anyone can join that. Uh, you have to pass the sort of basic AML CTF, it's run by a non-profit out, uh, out in Holland, or Amsterdam. And that uh, public quarter network is available for anybody running a quarter node, or running a quarter app, any consortiums, uh, business network operators are now starting to come together. It, from my perspective, looks like an internet. and the quarter space big silos of, of small networks um, and now the conversation around interoperability rages as we try and bring these these parties together um, so what we did was uh, for xdc uh, the digital currency is actually take that digital mutual off the shelf um, we uh, built some more functionality into it uh, that would allow it to run and govern a digital currency. Uh, from our perspective, um, in Lab 577, we were simply a consultancy uh, assisting the Cordite Society Limited. Cordite Society Limited is a legal entity in its own right. It's actually registered with the FCA, not in the terms of providing regulatory uh, services, but actually that's where the register of UK cooperatives uh, exists. Uh, and under that uh, uh, regulatory body, we find that the cooperative has to operate uh, within a set of rules. So there is actually mutual and therefore digital currency. Um, is an exchange token. I'll go on to that in a little bit more in a second. But the uh, purpose of this was to first of all release uh, that first exchange token onto the public quarter network, um, provide a supply of a uh, token that could be used uh, as a digital currency within the public quarter network um, and uh, allow others to come and join that 
cooperative society um, driving uh, the adoption of that public corner network and allow others to follow our footsteps, create their own digital currencies as uh, the projects uh, that are within that public corner network start to wonder how to uh, actually make payments uh, and deliver payments over the network rather than the pattern they're currently doing, which is make the payments outside the network and connect in uh, outside uh, into uh, existing ledgers. So that's a, a quick uh, walkthrough of Cordite uh, and XDC. Um, I'll just pause there before we, we step forward. Were there any questions around that? I know we could get, we get stuck on this for the, uh, the rest of the hour, but um, I'll, uh, I'll open it to the floor just then. Anyone else uh, questions, please ask. Uh, otherwise, I, I'll, you know, I have some, but uh, I'll wait for you guys to, uh, to come up with questions. I see that you are here, Craig. Uh, you probably have questions. No questions. <laughs> okay. Good. Okay, so um, obviously the websites, sorry, Vipin, you've got one. No, no, it looks like uh, money is... Uh, yeah, uh, I have a quick question. Um, how is, I'm sorry, this is Manny Pillai from uh, SwapSub. Um, how is your uh, digital mutuals different from Corda's uh, business network and membership, which they are you know, promoting as a way to create uh, business networks? Not dissimilar. And I'm really pleased you've, you've made that connection. So what we recognized when we brought the five Irish banks together um, to build a distributed uh, clearinghouse was because they knew each other and they knew each other quite well. They trusted each other and immediately they could create a legal entity that could run a centralized clearinghouse. And at that point, the conversation around should we use distributed ledger became a, 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 a little less um, useful and we could actually just run the, the clearinghouse with a database like we've done before. And that led us to a, a conversation that said, well, there's little point using a distributed ledger for a centralized business model. So actually those business network operators that are standing up uh, uh, consortiums on the public quarter network, many of them are, are, are highly centralized at this time and they're looking for ways to operate that business network um, very much for the members uh, and um, between the members. Uh, and therefore what we put on the table was a pattern if you wish to use that term, uh, a pattern uh, of a legal structure that you could use and actually operate that legal structure on Corda itself. So there's, a, there's, a, there's obviously a level of recursion or, or dog fooding there, uh, which was important. So we're really pleased you, you picked up on that. Um, from our perspective, the digital mutual is an exemplar of how we think you should run a business network um, on the public call network or, or any other uh, consortium or uh, Business network operation doesn't really matter about the technology underneath. Um, and that's really what we were showing in the creation of that digital mutual back in 2018. Um, is it dissimilar to the ones that they have uh, uh, brought up for uh, trade finance um, and other, other areas? Uh, and in, in case you didn't know, money is... Um, Created, uh, you know, he's worked for a long time on Corda, and he has a trading platform that uh, not only looks at the uh, uh, this uh, the payment side, like the XTC uh, token, but also tries to connect it to the uh, front to back uh, asset trading. So this becomes a payment leg, something like this becomes a payment leg for the uh, asset uh, exchange. Uh, that's, that's a, that is a uh, ambitious goal, but nonetheless. Yeah, um, yeah so just, we definitely will want to catch up later on, Richard. Uh, I also be in touch with Miles, so we can, we can, we can talk about it later on. No, absolutely, man. And, and you, you, you are absolutely uh, ahead of us in in, in many ways uh, with with the platform you've got and the way you're operating it. Uh, I think what we all recognise when we look at financial market infrastructure, uh, and if you just cast yourself for the last twenty five years, the banks have been 
focused on uh, their own internal systems and getting to efficiency or single sources of truth inside those banks. Um, for the next 20 years, we have to uh, bring banks together and improve the interconnects between those banks. And many of those interconnects are historic, built in the financial market infrastructure, as we, we tend to call it. And that financial market infrastructure has become uh, bloated uh, and high margin over time um, because the banks weren't that concerned with the cost base. Now that the banks are concerned with the cost base, um, they're driving and pushing hard on that market infrastructure. And that's why you're seeing a tremendous amount of disruption and investment back into the financial market infrastructure. So I think what we're showing here is different methods and different mechanisms that can be stood up. Um, we're very well aware, having been on the, on, on the inside, as many of you have, that uh, the banks come together, they create um, a piece of financial market infrastructure, and then within uh, a number of years, it becomes uh, monopolistic or, or gains pricing power, uh, and they've created themselves a problem or an issue or challenge uh, that they have to then deal with at a different point or a different life cycle. Um, that, that is one end of the spectrum. And, and some of the, the organizations that, uh, that have grown up, the Bloombergs, the Reuters, um, a lot of the, the stock exchanges are well funded because they have that uh, pricing power. Other end of the spectrum, uh, many of you are well aware of pockets of the financial infrastructure that is, it is very underfunded uh, because it is run as a non-profit um, and it is unable to sustain itself and no one loves it. The reason no one loves it is because it's underinvested in. Uh, and this challenge in the financial market infrastructure of how do we fund uh, pieces uh, continues to rage. Uh, if we look actually at the public quarter network, um, that's a conversation that has been going on now for two or three years um, where the public quarter network uh, could become uh, a business line of our three. Um, but actually, the members have worked extremely hard and the, and the ecosystem has worked extremely hard to persuade R3 not to try and own the public quarter network, but because by doing so, they will uh, undermine it um, and they will turn it into yet another monopolistic financial market infrastructure. So that's why you're seeing the public quarter network actually being run by non-profit away from R3. Um, and actually, R3 is in the business of, of selling quarter enterprise. And that separation is really important for us to uh, to be successful with the the uh, the vision of, of what we are expecting in uh, the disruption that blockchain brings to financial market infrastructure. Did that, uh, Manny? We can catch up later on uh, and, and how you could use XTC. Obviously, welcome you into the the mutual study. Um, not suggesting this is how you should run uh, the, the the platform you're building. Just it is a pattern that we have uh, we have shown and and uh, and are, are making obvious. Yeah, yeah, definitely we'll catch up later on in, you know, but yeah, yeah it, it's very interesting. I've been following Cordite for a while, so. Okay, now, um, uh, is there anyone else who has questions? Otherwise, I'll ask a couple more. Anyone else? Okay. Um, so, one thing you said uh, was that uh, this is, purely for efficiency gains. Uh, do you see other emerging um, use cases or emerging uh, sort of products that would uh, uh, justify investment in these areas rather than just, uh, just looking for efficiencies? Absolutely. So um, many of us came into this space not because of the efficiency gain. Uh, we came into it because we had an interest in the creation of a digital currency, Bitcoin, uh, and the innovation that that created. Uh, we then moved and uh, spent a lot of time in what we would describe as the enterprise blockchain space, which is an efficiency play. Uh, as I described it, it is the uh, removal of the friction between or interbank rather than intra-bank. Um, what, and I will go on to uh, uh, further slides to answer, uh, I think the conversation around efficiency gains is, uh, is, is, well, is well matured now. And actually, we're now back to a conversation about top line and revenue. And I think that's where it takes us into tokenization. 
So it's a really lovely uh, question. Probably takes me into my next slide. If there aren't any more questions on Cordite, happy to get into that, that top line uh, opportunities and revenue opportunities that we're seeing in the capital market space. I think you should get, get on uh, to that, uh, although I do have questions about Cordite, which I'll ask later. No, always happy to answer questions on Cordite. Uh, Cordite for us is, is, is a uh, place for us to drop out disruptive and controversial features. Uh, others are doing the same in the Cordite space, uh, and we always welcome others uh, who are keen to try things out uh, in an open source uh, fashion, where in actual fact, they may not want to do it under their own commercial brands. And uh, from our perspective, uh, this continues to uh, provide alternative business models to R3 and accelerate adoption uh, for Corda uh, into different verticals. So that's what Cordite is, it's what it offers um, from our perspective. It's now very much operating independently of, of R3 and Lab 577 and in, uh, in case uh, now Western RBS. Let me, uh, uh, let me move on. Sorry, there was a question. No, 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 go ahead. So I think uh, just, just uh, this will be, uh, unbelievably preaching to the choir so just bear with me because hopefully what it does is is just uh, allow us all to resonate on the on the same page you will have noticed that i've not mentioned central bank digital currencies until now you'll also notice that lab 577 isn't um involved in central bank digital currencies uh just a quick history uh the bank of england first uh went out with its design paper for the uk rtgs in 1989, they went live with it in 1999. They then broke cover with their second generation design paper in 2019. So it doesn't take much of a mathematician to work out that we're probably on track for a second generation UK RTGS in 2029. Uh, so with that kind of multi-decade play, I'm not that keen on getting involved in central bank digital currencies. It's a, it is a multi-decade play. You need a very deep pockets. Definitely need to be a salaried employee to get involved in that type of uh, affair. Um, what is interesting, and the reason I put this graph on the uh, on the, uh, the the table is, I'm not using in this uh, diagram, and it is borrowed from uh, I think uh, Todd actually over in the quarter space. Um, I think it was one of his blogs, um, so I'll give him credit. What's interesting is if you look at a central bank digital currency, it is a depository receipt, trust the custodian. Um, it is up on the left hand side. Um, but actually, it is a trust the custodian for the banks, the commercial banks that use the central bank as a depository receipt of their land receipts uh, or their other values, stores of value they then return, gain from the Bank of England uh, uh, a depository receipt uh, for the Bank of England's commercial, uh, the Bank of England's deposits. Um, for you and I, actually, that then becomes, or those tokens become a payment token. Uh, I carry uh, tokens around in my pocket um, and we use those around. So interestingly, the two things I would uh, bring to your attention on this diagram is, first of all, different custodians are acting on different timelines. So a commercial bank is very quick and very able to create deposit receipts, could do it tomorrow morning and does it in fact all of the time, while the central banks are going to take uh, a multiple decade to get into the situation. But when they do that, their token will actually, for the most majority of us, not be seen as a deposit receipt, but actually be seen as a payment token. And we will use it um, between each other as a payment token. So it's fascinating to look at this graph uh, from the other dimensions, specifically different actors are running at different timelines and different actors will see different tokens in different ways. So hopefully what I just did there was, was open up some thinking uh, for the audience. I recognize that I'm preaching to the choir. Most of you have been over this token type stuff for many years. Yeah. yeah. So there's a, there's a reason I wanted to go into it. If there's no kind of questions or as long as I've made sense and, and the crowd is resonating, I will, I will push forward onto the, 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 the purpose of, of actually bringing that, that graph out. Um, the reason for that is because you're all well aware that we're seeing what we would call a, a disruption in the capital market space. One of the reasons we stepped out of RBS was because we could see a disruption to the capital markets business. 
the creation of new digital currencies for the purposes of uh, payments, be it Ripple or, or Bitcoin Cash or, or Stella, wasn't that interesting to us. Um, the creation of capital, the ICO bubble, uh, was interesting. And that showed some clear benefits. Um, not that I need to go into those. You'll have seen those. Many of you are making business cases for tokenization. We're also now starting to see some really good analysis that shows how quickly we think tokenization will take, uh, take traction um, and to what scale. Um, but I think push through that and you will now start to see what's going on over in the crypto space. I will take you towards Uniswap uh, and others where the idea that we can have automated liquidity provision or more importantly, the atomic and riskless DVP. So one of the questions that have been put to me on the, uh, the talk and the context was around payment legs uh, and the snarly problem uh, of settlement and payments. And actually, one of the reasons that we came into this space, uh, many of us joined this space, is because payments are done uh, discreetly through a totally different uh, fabric or veil than the actual goods and services that they're being paid for. So it doesn't matter if you're settling in the capital markets business for trades coming in on one side, or whether you're in the real economy buying and selling goods, wine, cocoa, doesn't matter. The fact is, is your payments will be separate legs, even though they are actually two parts or two legs of the same atomic transaction. And the goal or vision that we all have is to be able to make payments on the same fabric or the same rail as the goods and services that are going the other way. Um, and that, to my mind, is, is really what you're now starting to see in the crypto space. And that will start to appear over on the, the mainstream finance side relatively quickly over in 2021 is the idea of atomic or riskless DVP and the idea of automated liquidity provision. Uh, you, don't, you don't lock up $3 billion uh, worth of liquidity um, in uh, Uniswap pools uh, without having solved somebody's problem. And for my mind, anybody that hasn't looked into that space uh, should start looking into that space. Uh, it is a ex extremely exciting part of the uh, uh, of the crypto puzzle. So that's on the on the tokenization side. Any questions around that? Uh, there is a whole movement that claims that uh, DeFi will go towards uh, CFI, and where uh, you know where 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 the twain shall meet and also where it, it might get taken over by the CFI space. Um, some of these ideas, I mean, you know, the, the ideas behind things like Uniswap or uh, Maker, uh, Maker and others. So, so for, for us, um, our view on this is, is relatively straightforward. Um, Finance is already decentralized. Um, you have uh, a large number of banks. One of the best decentralized networks we have is SWIFT, and that's operated exceptionally well um, over, the, uh, over the decades. So it's nothing new around decentralized finance. Um, EFI as a movement um, is bringing new thinking and new ideas to this space, but in many ways it's bringing old ideas. <laughs> and, the irony for us, uh, where in the Bitcoin and crypto space, uh, there's been a rapid rise of highly centralized exchanges, the Binance, uh, the BitMEXs, and they have sought to build um, the same finance market infrastructure, highly centralized finance market infrastructure. They're building that over in the crypto space while at the same time over in the uh, financial markets, We've just spent the last half a decade trying to use the same technology to dis dismantle and dis intermediate our centralized financial markets infrastructure. So the irony that the technology uh, uh, is being centralized over in the decentralized space and is uh, being decentralized in the centralized space. You've seen Hong Kong, Singapore and Switzerland now 
uh, starting to adjust their regulation as they recognize that they may have over centralized um, over centralized their regulation uh, and forced the creation of centralized financial market infrastructure uh, and thus provided monopolistic or, or uh, key uh, risks uh, single single key risks um, in their uh, in their infrastructures uh, what we have always pointed out is that these two sides mainstream finance and crypto are converging uh, you can see crypto um, kraken taking a banking license um, you've just seen paypal uh, start listing crypto um, we always use the last line of the uh, the animal farm book the creatures looked from man to pig and pig to man, and they could not see the difference. It is only a matter of time between these two start converging and you will not notice the difference between the two. Uh, the reason that we, we pick Uniswap is Uniswap is uh, a really uh, interesting way of uh, discovering price. Uh, it is certainly novel uh, and we haven't seen that um, price discovery action uh, for uh, in, in the mainstream financial market space for a while. Um, and that is why it's interesting. It's also flawed because of course, anyone uh, can go into Uniswap and with that type of AML, CTF or lack of AML and CF, CFT, um, you, you're not gonna see in that space, uh, the creation of uh, large scale financial institutions engaging. Uh, what Uniswap has done is created a starting gun uh, for the creation of uh, financial grade uh, Uniswaps, I would suggest. Uh, so pushing forward into, if there's, uh, I'll just push forward into the, the slides, I think. Just yes. give everyone a, just, just pushing forward into the, into the, the market trend that we've been focusing on over in Lab 577, uh, and this is where Digital Asset Shade Ledger uh, comes to, to to part of the solution. Um, we obviously uh, have learned a lot from Cordite and we build on top of Cordite. Um, we've watched and learned uh, from many of the projects we've been involved in uh, in the Corda space and other um, technologies. Um, and actually in the digital shared ledger space, uh, we're very interested in the high potential uh, of private institutional markets um, where the public markets, both retail and institutional, are well served uh, after considerable investment over the past decades. Um, it's uh, quite considerable investment uh, for those trying to recreate or re-platform uh, those public retail and institutional markets. Um, that is not a high potential space for the market. Um, where we do see high potential is in the private uh, securities, uh, the unlisted, where we do see a, a liquid and therefore lack of price discovery. Um, you can't see the deal flow. There we it is. Um, where in actual fact, the cost of an IPO to become a public security um, is a barrier to entry, especially after the tsunami of regulation. Add that to the fact that the black magic of securitization, which used to have a half million dollar price tag to it, is now costing $50,000 to uh, create an SPV and operate it. And that quantum reduction in the cost of securitization means we've gone from a very small number of issuers in a place like Switzerland to hundreds in Switzerland. So before there only used to be Credit Suisse, UBS would do your securitizations. Now there are um, uh, hundreds of, of issuers of securities in Switzerland um, who are able to create private securities uh, in a matter of days with ISINs. They all look identical to uh, a security issued out by one of the, one of the big crowd. Um, there is always a push towards the retail and that, what that actually means is a reduction in the ticket size. So one of the reasons that blockchain technology or distributed ledger is useful in this space, and the reason that ticket sizes are kept large is because you only want to deal with a small number uh, of investors. As you reduce the ticket size, you obviously 
dramatically increase uh, the number of investors. And to do that, you need to have a technology which allows you to track the asset register and more importantly, be able to pay out the coupons, the dividends uh, as you go through. Um, we're obviously pushing here at a vision, but the firms are plagued by having discrete data silos. Um, most private securities live and die within the bounds of the institution that issued it, the Credit Suisse, the UBS, JP Morgan's. And one of the things we are keen to do is get outside of those silos and get into a situation where we are able to issue uh, securities, securitize and issue uh, on alternative assets uh, and make those mainstream uh, in the private space. And you're, we're not the only ones pushing on this space. You can very much see it. But it's a market trend. And I wanted to, uh, to share that with yourselves uh, and make sure it, uh, uh, it resonates. Uh, is there any questions around this as, a, as an obvious market trend? No. Okay. Then I'll then I'll push on to to digital asset shared ledger. Um, so from our perspective, uh, digital asset ledger builds on the top of Cordite. Uh, first and foremost, it's a two-year technology accelerator um, that uh, companies are buying. I'll go on to uh, some of the some of the clients we've we picked up. They are taking uh, Dazzle uh, as a uh, white label technology uh, that they can use. Um, Obviously, it builds on the top of Corda, uh, and on top of Corda, it provides uh, tokens, assets, uh, a surface, an API uh, that you can use out of the box, and it gives firms coming to the market um, to build, uh, could be a token platform, uh, could be a, a settlement rail, uh, could be a central bank digital currency, provides them a ready-made Corda solution uh, that they can then use um, out of the box. Um, they can either uh, host that themselves or, or we can run it for them. And a lot of companies just keep coming to us to buy Dazzle for their own purposes. Um, but when you buy Dazzle, you're also being onboarded to the public quarter network. And in doing so, uh, you've then got a technology um, and you are becoming part of a uh, digital asset liquidity network that allows financial institutions and corporations um, we only really see legal entities. We don't see natural legal entities. Legal entities coming onto the public quarter network, they are running that node and they are able to operate across that node with accounts, with tokens, uh, very much the same style of functionality you see uh, with wallets um, and tokens over on the, uh, on the uh, Ethereum and uh, public blockchain side. You're now getting to see that uh, on a finance grade platform such as Corda. Um, our target market has always been financial institutions, uh, where we're very much focused on buy side and sell side firms. Obviously, on the sell side firms, um, Dazzle is being used to offer assurance. They're doing asset right digitization. Um, they want to build books, uh, do a primary issuance, uh, and get um, control over the asset registry. Um, they're obviously working with partners such as custodians, who ultimately hold on to those uh, tokens um, and provide the custodian solution. Uh, there's certain disruptions going on in the market there. Um, and then on the other side, the buy side, uh, who are then taking, uh, mostly brokers in this case, uh, are taking Dazzle to use it uh, to hold those tokens on behalf of their clients and allow clients' portfolios uh, to, uh, to own and have uh, alternative assets that have been issued out onto the, onto the Dazzle network. And last but not least, um, not there yet, uh, but we are expecting the secondary uh, venues, the liquidity venues, uh, to, uh, to come onto this network. Uh, we're already starting to see uh, projects in the, uh, in the case of things like Archax, SDX, uh, heading towards the quarter network, um, and, and we're working closely with them. Um, whether they, uh, they join the, uh, the business network operation of, of Dazzle uh, it remains to be seen. But from our perspective, we're uh, positioning ourselves very much at the heart of that public quarter network uh, as the leading digital asset liquidity network uh, for financial institutions. There's got to be questions on this one. Um, Richard, this is Manny again. Um, is your Dazzle based upon the Corda token API? I know the early days of Corda, it was having its own infrastructure for, for tokens. So uh, we've got, obviously, Corda predates token SDK. We worked very closely with the R3 company to, to make the token SDK. Um, and what we do with Dazzle is, is make Dazzle um, token SDK compliant. Uh, the one reason 
for working with the R3 company was to make sure that we had a, uh, an interoperable solution for tokens in the quarter network. And that's what token SDK is. And absolutely, underneath the covers, token SDK is, is inside Dazzle. Um, you've got to remember, though, that uh, on the Cordite side, um, Cordite was specifically targeted at crypto assets. Um, <laughs> and the uh, Cordite token uh, capability actually allows you to do, uh, to wrap things like Ethereum uh, or ETH, sorry, not Ethereum, ETH. Uh, which has a higher level of precision. Token SDK doesn't have that. Uh, but from our perspective in Dazzle, we're agnostic to which, uh, which ones you use. But absolutely, we're, we pushed hard for that token SDK standard, uh, and therefore we're, we're using that inside Dazzle. Good question. Thank you. I Go ahead. Hi, this is Elizabeth Matthew of Securitize. Uh, thank you for this um, for this discussion. A question on Dazzle: Is it? Can you think of it as a Kaleido for Corda? Uh, Are you essentially what, bringing what? So, is it is it Corda as a service to a prospective um, institution that wants to participate in a network, or is it the network? Sorry, do you want to just walk through that question again? I just want to make sure I got the, the question correct. I'm just trying to understand. Um, so, so I think of um, these marketplaces with you know the digital assets and data um, as uh, a product, a final product of different institutions deciding to participate in a network and providing um, um, you know assets and data. And so does, does Dazzle, is Dazzle the network operator for such a marketplace? Or is it the, um, uh, the blockchain as a service tool to enable a participant to join the network, the marketplace? Yep, no, great question. So, so just a bit of delineation. Um, obviously, we're operating on top of the public quarter network. And so the actual network infrastructure, the low-level network infrastructure is the public quarter network. Um, uh, on top of that, of course, you've got a protocol quarter, um, and that's operating as a, as a base level. You can use a horrid turn of operating system, if you will, but the quarter. Um, and Dazzle um, then is operating as a uh, network, a uh, business network on top of that, um, that participants can join um, uh, as legal entities, they join the public quarter network and then they run the quarter app called Dazzle. Uh, and that then gives them the ability to operate um, tokens uh, on the quarter network. Um, we do not see ourselves as the network. Uh, we are building a liquidity network. We'd like to think of ourselves as the leading one. Um, what we do have, um, and this is the confusion and I absolutely love the question, what we are doing obviously is uh, white labeling Dazzle uh, and selling that to others. Um, you all have seen in the press that IVNO um, have uh, broken cover uh, on their partnership with us. They're using Dazzle underneath the covers um, and companies are very, uh, we're very comfortable with, uh, with, uh, with clients taking Dazzle as a technology base and using it uh, to build their own private network if they wish to, um, away from the public quarter network, away from the Dazzle network, uh, and using the Dazzle technology uh, to build it. Uh, and the reason for that is because we know that over time, um, this would drive interoperability uh, because at some point they will want to come back uh, and want to interconnect. Uh, and from our perspective, from a Lab 577 perspective, we're simply, uh, I could only use the term hedging our bets, uh, on the basis that uh, we are building uh, a digital asset liquidity network, which something like Tokenize can join, um, and Tokenize can join and use it uh, to issue tokens onto the public quarter network that you would do on the Ethereum network when you deploy a contract. Um, and you can come onto that network as a single entity, um, or uh, you can come to me and actually ask to, uh, to, to uh, white label Dazzle uh, and you can 
um, build that into the, the bottom of, of tokenize and go and build your own proprietary platform, your own network, your own private network. And that very much depends on what jurisdiction you're operating in, what clients you're trying to operate with, and what type of business you're trying to build. Said so no size fits all, uh, or one size does not fit all. And therefore, we've come to market on both sides once as a white label technology, a technology accelerator, and secondly, as a, as a network which you can join. Um, and you can operate Dazzle as a, a node. Uh, sorry, your legal entity can operate Dazzle as a node and join that network. Does that make sense? Did I answer that? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, a, a quick question, follow-up question, uh, Richard. Um, you know, when in Ethereum, you always have a like an or, you know in, in general blockchain, you have a world state. At any point of time, if, if I'm an issuer, I would know exactly who holds the token and how much. Coda uh, being a private. Uh, became privacy oriented network. Um, how do you bring that world state to the issuer? So the uh, interesting thing on Dazzle is, as you have to point out, Corda nodes are peer to peer. Uh, they don't have a uh, global addressable space to work to. Um, in actual fact, uh, the reason for that architectural decision was so that you could have privacy between the transactions. Uh, Dazzle has uh, underneath the covers, um, one of the pieces of functionality that we built into Dazzle is an asset register. So the issuer of a token is able to track where the token is. So each token as it moves, um, as it is transferred from one node to the next, one account to the next, um, across the network does actually call home. Uh, it's an ET style home, ET call home style functionality as we call it. Um, and so the asset register in real time uh, is updated uh, as the token transfers. So unlike uh, the Bitcoins and Ethereums where you are simply updating the, uh, the, the pointer to who owns, i.e. The, the, the private key, uh, the public key uh, denotes who owns, uh, who is part of this asset register. Um, as a token is transferred from one node to another uh, across the network uh, in, in the quarter network, public quarter network. So the issuer um, who is holding the asset register has a real time updated uh, uh, view of the, the data, but only the two parties, the, the buyer and the seller and the asset register, uh, the issuer of the token have that knowledge. No one else in the network does. So, which means that if I uh, transfer to money and money wants to uh, transfer to, let's say, Elizabeth, um, that means that money's transfer to Elizabeth is now backed by this asset register because she really does not know whether I, whether I transferred to money and money is the actual owner of those tokens. The only way to know that is to go back to the phone home to the asset register and then uh, look at the account. And, and then of course she has to have her own account and then money will transfer, well, money will transfer money or assets to her. Is that, is and the that reason, that's correct. And so the, the reason for doing that um, was because most jurisdictions uh, there is a requirement for an asset registry um, and you need to know where those tokens are at any one point in time and therefore the issuer of those tokens, um, the, the, let's, be a, let's be a bond as a good example, when a bond is issued, um, the asset register or the issuer of that needs to retain that asset registry um, at all times and that's exactly why that functionality was built. Um, there's another good reason for doing it um, and that's because when we come to pay the coupon or dividend, depending on the, uh, the instrument type, uh, we actually need to be able to deliver the payment of the coupon. And we do that exactly the same way as we would do uh, where the coupon is actually a cash token. Um, it has a uh, settlement uh, instruction um, inside it. And when you receive a cash token, um, actually what you're receiving uh, is a promissory note uh, from a paying agent or a bank um, who has issued those cash tokens. Um, having received that coupon, uh, if you apply an IBAN into it, um, the payment can then be settled um, 
usually off ledger. We don't usually tend to settle it on ledger. Uh, what we do is uh, it fires a payment instruction out from the, uh, the back of that um, issuer of that cash token um, and the settlement is made. So what I just did there was walk through the asset registry, uh, which obviously follows the secondary trading and keeps track of, of where the tokens are owned and the jurisdictional requirement for that. And then actually one of the reasons for keeping an asset registry is so that you know who to pay coupons to and with the coupons, um, what we talked through there was uh, the basic cash uh, token, uh, which is effectively a promissory note, uh, which allows uh, institutions to, to send cash tokens around the, the uh, network and at any point in time settle them uh, back to the bank that issued them or the paying agent, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, you know, this is the problem of the cap table and being able to... Uh, look at the beneficial owners at any point in time uh, and then of course uh, taking action based on that you know for various uh, purposes for paying dividends for paying coupons for uh, paying back the bond you know as the bond as the bond matures all that stuff but it, this means that uh, the uh, uh, the issuer is a silent or maybe not even a silent partner in every bilateral transaction. Is that right? So uh, that is correct. And actually, in fact, if you brought onto the ledger um, uh, an asset that was off ledger, um, let's say you're trying to, uh, you would use something like a custodian. Um, and what we're doing here is not changing many of the models, uh, business models that are out there. Um, if you wish to represent a, a share uh, on the network, you're either doing that um, as an issuing uh, firm, uh, and actually the asset register would be held by a custodian. Uh, and in many cases, jurisdictionally, you're required that the custodian with a custodian license owns that, that uh, the issuance of those uh, shares into the uh, so issuers of those financial instruments and, and looks after that asset registry. So there's a, there's a number of actors in this space and depending on who's issuing the tokens depends on what the token represents. So custodians could walk into this space very easily and start representing, uh, tokenizing uh, assets that they hold and they're custodying uh, onto the network and at any point in time holding an asset registry. So that would be, in my book, a, a digital repository. Uh, a, a depository receipt, so a GDR or an ADR. So is that a asset registry now become centralized? So at that point, you're, well, you're, you're right in terms of the asset registry is owned and centralized in that uh, issuing entity. So either the issuing entity that issued the, uh, the, the, the piece or the custodian that's then issuing uh, onto the network uh, is running that asset registry. And, and absolutely, from our perspective, we weren't changing, we're not trying to change um, it into a de decentralized asset registry. What we're trying to do is use the decentralized ledger to keep track of the secondary trading uh, and the secondary ownership of those, and therefore making it uh, much easier to track the asset registry. So will the... Um issuer also have uh, other responsibilities for example if the transfer is to somebody who's not who's not kyc or aml or has some other uh, limits on ownership like you know for example sometimes the cap cap tables have uh, limits on ownership uh, of uh, certain assets by a single entity uh, so those kind of actions, are they uh, part of the uh, smart contracts themselves or are they uh, actually done by uh, active intervention by the issuer, uh, by the people who are in, so, in charge of the asset registry? So in, in terms of the, um, I will answer the, the former, the um, fact that you have a, a JVM in there, um, and that the uh, asset types are, are highly configurable uh, and more importantly you can add uh, 
add the Dazzle code base into your own Cord app uh, means that you can then build any more complex uh, product types or asset types as you wish to. So we would obviously recommend uh, that if that's the case, that you wish to constrain the asset type in, in whichever way you want, that's exactly where the smart contract uh, capability comes into play. You're creating an asset type uh, that has some limitations and the asset should uh, should itself uh, enforce those constraints um, so that uh, parties can't uh, own a certain percentage or, or whatever the constraint is. Now, how you do that in practice uh, is very much how you code that into the Cord app. Well, uh, does that mean, for example, in the example that I cited about, uh, that uh, you know, money is transferring to Elizabeth, and I have, uh, you know, I'm transferring something to money. He's transferring to Elizabeth. Now, Elizabeth also has. Uh, uh, assets coming in from other sources. So the, her cap table would only be visible if you can have access to the uh, total asset registry. Anyway, I, I don't want to go into the uh, details of this because it's already 11 o'clock and we have spent a very interesting hour uh, talking about all this stuff. And uh, I think, uh, you know, we'll engage offline. Uh, through the Capital Market SIG. And I thank you, Richard, for showing up. Not at all. So I said, uh, Vivian, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for the, for the participants to come on nice. um, As I say, for some of you, this will be old. You've heard my voice before on a number of occasions. For, for others, this is the first time you've heard uh, from me. Um, I uh, have just walked through a rapid pace, a huge level of uh, material that we wouldn't normally ram into this this hour is just uh, knowing the uh, special interest group and the members of the special interest group um, i'm well aware that you you're pretty much up to speed on at the top of the curve uh, and therefore i could rattle through it at, at speed we covered off cordite uh, and the release of xdc um, i would absolutely um, love to start a conversation with any of you uh, around uh, how xdc could help your firms uh, how cordite could help your firms uh, and obviously uh, uh, from the point of view of dazzle um, great to, uh, I know that uh, Manny Miles is already talking to you, but Elizabeth, um, over on the tokenized side, uh, if you're interested, very happy to have a conversation with you uh, about how yeah. Dazzle can help you. Um, from the quarter side, uh, we are, uh, uh, we're very open uh, and Dazzle is, is there to serve. So very open to conversations. Definitely, definitely will follow up. Thank you, Manny. No other, no other uh, uh, questions. It sounds Vivian. Uh, you. Yes. Yes, I'm on. Yeah, um, yeah uh, we are going to, um, um, you know, terminate the this meeting, and we'll talk later. And you'll have the recording of this available, and we can expand on this stuff. I look forward. Thank you. What's what's the best way to reach you? Is there an email or? Yeah, Richard uh, uh, RC at uh, lab five seven seven dot io. There we go. <laughs> anyway, uh, I I can put you in touch with him. Thanks. What I'll do is I'll share Thanks, the I'll share the I'll share the pack I'll share the pack with the rest of the group and uh, uh, and we'll uh, look forward to uh, to uh, chatting to you on the uh, on the other side. Sounds great. Thank you. Appreciate it. Two minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.